Hello everybody, welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Simon Whiteley and I'll introduce myself a little bit more in a moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to what's called CAST Accident Analysis and that stands for Causal Analysis Based on Stamp and I'll explain what stamp is later on. And I'll be talking through uh, to the best I can about a case study involving uh, unintended overexposure of a patient, Lisa Norris, during radiotherapy treatment at Beetson Oncology Centre in Glasgow from January 2006. So just so I can get a better feeling for who you are in the audience, uh, can you basically give me a show of hands, let me know which of these categories you are. So if you're a nurse or you're a clinician, can you give me a show of your hands so I can understand? Okay. Today. That's, today. They can't come, they have to do the contingency. Ah, yeah. okay. Uh, radiation oncologist. Okay. See, so this shows my uh, limited experience with radio. No worry. We are all radio therapy. <laughs> <coughs> Nearly. A therapeutic radiographer. Oh, right. Like everybody. Right. This is a popular one. Okay. Medical dosimetrist. Got a couple of those, kind of. Not sure. Medical physicist. I've yeah, got one there. Oh, excellent. Okay. Now, in the context of the regulations, does anybody consider themselves an employer? No? What about a referrer? No, maybe? Operator? Oh, well, we've got a few of those, excellent. Practitioner? No, okay, that's interesting. Any others that I've not got on that list that you think I should uh, be aware of? MPE. MPE. What does that stand for? Medi Medical Medical Physics. Excellent, there we go, brilliant. That is in the regulations and I've not included it, sorry about that. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Right then, so on a scale of 0 to 10, how familiar are you with the actual event itself? So uh, 0 to 5, okay, five, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, oh brilliant, we've got some 9s, excellent, okay. What about the investigation report itself? So uh, 0 to 5, okay, 6, 7, Eight, nine, ten, maybe. <laughs> okay, what about system safety engineering and particularly fault tree analysis or failure modes and effects analysis? Zero to five. Oh, there we go. Got one. <laughs> is it, it's jumping the gun. Is that a ten? Is that? It's a ten. <laughs> okay, well, sorry, six onwards. Six, seven, eight, nine. Any tens? Nines, tens. Okay, that's interesting. And what about stamps? So I said the. Uh, not everybody knows what FMEA is. Okay, that's fine. So that, was that, that be a zero? zero yeah. Is that a zero then? Is it? Okay. Well volunteered, thank you. Um, so, systems theoretic accident model and processes, so STAMP. So, zero to five. What was it? Oh, okay. All right. What about beyond five? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten? No? Okay. You should know this, Donna. Come on. <laughs> okay, what about cast accident analysis? Causal analysis using STAMP. 0 to 5, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, okay, so this is going to be a tough crowd today, that's fine, we can deal with that. So who am I? Well my name's Simon Whiteley, I'm a system safety engineering consultant, I work primarily in aerospace and defence, so aircraft, large aircraft, fast jets, helicopters, uh, jet engines, uh, air traffic control, uh, weapon systems, so surface to air missile systems, development, so if I'm not trying to shoot aircraft out of the sky, I'm trying to stop them crashing together. Um, I also have experience in uh, nuclear weapons manufacturing, nuclear facilities, um, air, uh, railways, a little bit of healthcare IT, so blood test result records and patient records, uh, railways, and most recently, oil and gas drilling offshore. So in terms of radiology and radiotherapy, I keep getting those uh, mixed up, I do apologize. Uh, my experience is quite limited. So the stuff that you'll see today is based on my limited experience over the last sort of three, three or four weeks. So please be gentle, but I'd like to learn from you as much as I can because I think what I'm going to talk about today could really benefit what you do. So I provide specialist training and senior level coaching. Um, I'm a bit of a pioneer and explorer with STAMP. And I'm not saying that to sort of blow my own trumpet. What I'm trying to do is highlight that it is early days for these approaches. And so not many people know about them and I'm trying to do my best 
to be a bit of a super spreader talking about coronavirus. Um, I'm also a YouTuber, that can be positive or negative, but essentially I'm using social media as much as I can to sort of influence as many people as I can to try and drag this out of academia and get it in the mainstream and really help people get some good results. So the basic objectives of my talk today are to, number one, exercise your mind. As the saying goes, minds are like parachutes, they only work if they're open. The second is to do a little bit of practice to get the cogs working in your mind. And I also want to promote the freedom to ask questions, especially stupid questions. So if, you've, if you're not sure about something, you know, like FMEA, please stick your hand up, shout it out. If I can't answer it at that moment, I'll wait until the end and we can have a conversation. But also for you, in terms of potential opportunities, so if there's things that I'm saying that sort of really gel with what you think or might help in your situation and it looks like a potential opportunity, then don't hesitate to come and talk to me and I'll answer any questions that you've got. So the objectives of the presentation today is to recognise what is meant by stamp and cast. So when I asked you those questions earlier on, now after this training you'll know what they are. Understand the core process of cast accident analysis and then appreciate how to apply a cast analysis as part of an accident analysis itself. Now I've put some slides on the tables around you. Um, there aren't, you know, there's, I think there's one or two per table, so you know, get those out, have a look. There are some basic concepts in here that I'll refer to, so make yourselves familiar with those and we'll, we'll refer to them later. But before we begin, before we jump in, <laughs> before we open our parachutes, on the next slide, I'm going to put a word on the slide and I want to uh, essentially hear from you what that word evokes in your mind. So when you see this word, your brain will tell you what you associate with it and I'd like you to shout it out and tell me what they are. So are we ready? Everyone paying attention. So this word, what does it mean to you? Food. Food? Food? Yeah. Food. Food? Any more? Any? Fruit? An orange? An orange? <laughs> what, what do you mean by orange? Clarify. An orange, a fruit. Okay. Yeah. Any more? The colour. The colour orange. Okay, great. Any more for any more? Sunset. Sunset, yeah. More? Mobile phones. Mobile phones, yeah, excellent. Okay. <laughs> Say again. The future is orange. The future is orange. There we go. There's a market. I'll delete that out of the video. So we talked about fruit, talked about mobile phones, we talked about colours, flavours. Uh, nobody mentioned Donald Trump, which was quite interesting. I get that quite a lot. Um, but also, when I was training in Norway a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the things that they came out with, being Norwegian, was Easter, because they like to go skiing at Easter. And when they ski, they traditionally have oranges to eat. So that was a new one for me. Uh, you'll notice as well that the colour I've represented this word in is blue. So I tried to trip you up a little bit, a bit of human factors there. Um, but you did well, that's great. So the reason I've done that, the reason I've started to open your parachute is to get you to th start thinking about your thinking. So become mindful about how you think and also about how your brain automatically responds to things based on your experience and your behaviours and your beliefs. So focus, be, be mindful about how you think. And then also to highlight the aspects of a label and the concepts that you automatically associate with it. Because today I'm going to use a lot of general English language words that you will already have definitions and concepts attached to. And what I want to do is make you aware that when I use these normal words, I'm referring to a specific concept. So I just want to wake you up to that and really get your mind working. So another word. Shout out what this word means to you. Everyone's going quiet. Say again. Order. Order. Okay. Yeah. Any more? Say again. Computers. Computers, okay, yeah. Yeah, there we go, that's more a technical description. Any more for any more? Yeah, even more technical, great. This is awesome, this is exactly what I wanted. All I wanted to do is highlight that when I'm talking about system, I'm talking about it in the more broad concept of something that has some entities that interact and they have a structure, some kind of hierarchy, and there are emergent properties and, of course, boundaries. And those boundaries are based on your perception, your construction. 
So from a perspective aspect, what I'd like you to do is be mindful about how you think, but also the perspective that you're thinking from. So are you inside, conceptually inside the system when you're thinking about it, or are you stood outside of it, observing it? And then think about the boundaries. Think about whether they're hard physical boundaries or whether they're boundaries based on your knowledge and experience. So we've talked a lot about thinking. Let's have a think about the actual mechanism behind thinking. So when you're trying to understand the problem, we did some of that this morning, try and understand the problem and come up with some solutions, most of us will think in terms of trying to break a problem down into parts and try and solve the parts and put it back together. Some of us will also think about it in terms of how do we build it up, you know, what is the big picture associated with this. We'll also be doing some level of abstraction, so we'll be zooming in, looking at the detail, the specifics, or we'll be taking a step back and looking at the really big picture. And each level of abstraction will have different levels of information, and our brains do it automatically and dynamically as we're thinking about something. We're not often conscious that that's what the brain is doing. And also the concept of mental models. So hands up who's familiar with mental models. Okay, so conceptually it is just a model in your mind that you create about something. So when I put the word orange on the board, your brain automatically populated your mind with a mental model of an orange, either a fruit or a colour, something like that, or a mobile phone company. What about the word control? What does that mean to you? Let's shout that out, let's hear. Safe. Ah, oh, very good. Straight to the answer. Okay. Any more for control? Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. Okay. Any more? Having the ability to change. Excellent. Steering. Yeah. Any more? What about you? I say order. <coughs> order again. Order again. These things are under control. There. In order. Excellent. Brilliant. You're all brilliant. This is great. Okay. So when we're thinking about control, the concept of control. We want to deal with things, we want to do something about things that we're interested in or concerns that we've got or risks or hazards if you want to get more formal. And the method of control will involve some type of constraint. And when I use the word constraint as a very broad label, that could be anything from literally a, you know, a protocol that's issued right through to a hazardous warning label on a door right through to literal mechanical you know boundaries on a you know on a bunker for example so the label constraints is a bit of a bucket for all manner of different ways to control things that you're interested in so hands up who's familiar with this concept so this is a very basic control loop we've been talking a lot this morning about control which is quite miraculous quite interesting is it familiar? Not sure, maybe. Okay, that's fine, no worries. Yes? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, okay. Awesome. Well, this is basically the, one of the core foundational concepts of what I'm going to talk about today. And essentially, we're talking about a control process, and this can be anything from, you mentioned there, perhaps driving your car. So the control process could be the movement of the vehicle, uh, the stat statistics and numbers and graphs we saw before lunch, that could be the healthcare operation from a management perspective, or it could be the number of incidents if you're tracking incident data. The controller, conceptually, that could be you, a person, it could be a management team, it could be an organisation, it could be technology. You know, if you've got some artificial intelligence out there, that could be a controller of some type of process. And that controller influences or constrains or controls that process through some form of control actions. And again, that's a very high concept. I'm not being specific. It could be physical direct control or it could be indirect control, you know, maybe shining lights or sending emails or something. Then we've got the concept of a control algorithm. And this is quite a technical term. But I don't want to scare you with that, I just want to say it is a, a label for a concept of things like responsibilities or strategies or behaviours 
or patterns. And essentially the control algorithm defines how that controller will interact and influence with that control process. Then we've got a process or mental model. And again, they are technical terms, but essentially they're a label for a bucket of uh, understanding about the control process. So if you're talking about the management example before the break, the mental model of that uh, management team is based on the statistics and data that is provided to them. So they get a mental model of the operation that they are concerned with controlling. Now I was going to get a picture of a Corona beer bucket, but you know it, it wasn't one available. Budweiser is the best I could get. But essentially I just want to emphasize that the concept of control algorithm and mental model or process model, they're just words to represent a bucket of things to do with behaviours and uh, process information or states. So then we've got some feedback and the feedback essentially informs the controller about the state and behaviour of the control process and that information is used to update the process model or mental model such that the controller understands what's happening in the process and then can make appropriate changes or control actions. So that's essentially a basic control loop, and this is one of the core concepts of what we're going to talk about today. Now you'll be asking yourself, well Simon, why, why are you telling me this? What, what's that all about? Well the main reason I'm telling you about this now, at the beginning of the presentation, is because I want to update your mental models about this topic. And I also want to update your control algorithms. I want to equip you with a slightly different way of thinking about safety and safety management so that you can go on potentially and have a go at applying this yourselves. So now a little bit of context. Why should you pay attention? Or why should you pay attention? That's totally different there. This is something essentially new. Now, just a bit of background, my background now, and I've not really spoken about this uh, publicly before, so please bear with me. Uh, hands up who's familiar with the RAF Nimrod crash from 2006? I know you would. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a few of you. Okay, so just a bit of context. So in 2006, uh, the RAF lost one of their Nimrod aircraft, the, the aircraft you can see on the left there, and due to a fire and explosion on board the aircraft when it was operating. And unfortunately, that led to the loss of these uh, 14 precious lives. Now, in 2009, I was contracting, contracted to do an independent technical evaluation of that aircraft and its sister aircraft to make an assessment as to whether it was safe to continue operations. Now when the accident occurred in 2006, there was an official Ministry of Defence Board of Inquiry that identified some technical issues and organisational issues, and then because of the scale of the loss of life, I think it was the largest since 1982 in the Falklands, that kicked off uh, Sir Charles Haddon Cave QC's official Nimrod review. And that Nimrod review from a military aviation perspective had a huge, huge impact on the way that military aviation is uh, performed in the UK. I mean, it was a phenomenal difference, phenomenal change. Now, the work I was doing was leading a team of subject matter experts in parallel to the work that Sir Charles Haddon Cave was doing, so not related to his, his work. We were related to look at the aircraft and the technical aspects. So we spent time crawling all over the aeroplanes, examining them, talking to maintainers, visiting the airfields, talking to the manufacturer, talking to the Ministry of Defence and the RAF as operators, and with a subject matter expert team of different disciplines. Now, <clears throat> this was 2009. This report was issued in 2000, September, October 2009, and this also coincided with me beginning my self-funded master's degree in safety critical systems engineering at the University of York. So I sort of embarked on a journey of discovery from an academic perspective, reading lots of books, learning about safety, safety engineering and the theories that go behind it. But also, this book was released, I don't know if you can see that. Engineer in a Safer World. So the Professor Nancy Leveson from MIT who wrote this book, she released a draft copy of it during 2009 and I started to read it as part of my becoming an academic and doing my masters and I started to see that there were some ideas in there that really sort of overcame a lot of the challenges that we were dealing with as part of our independent evaluation because most of the work is focused on the technical aspects of the aircraft but they weren't the only reasons why the aircraft crashed. There were many other organisational 
uh, management, uh, information, trend data. There were so many issues all over the system that uh, the traditional methods we, we used just didn't really fit. They didn't answer the questions. They left more questions than answers. And so when I saw the draft of this book and started to look at some of the ideas, they started to click and I thought, well, this is quite interesting. I'm going to follow this up and try and learn as much as I can. And so it started a journey of discovery of applying the methods that are described in this book and, of course, visiting the US uh, a number of times. <clears throat> Hands up who's familiar with the diffusion of innovation curve. Awesome, this is great. It's the first crowd that's seen so many. I mean, this is like the spread of uh, the coronavirus, but I won't joke about it too much. Um, <clears throat> essentially, what I'm showing here is where STAMP is today. So it is at the very early stage, you know, the, the, there's a few patient zeros, so to speak, um, and not many others that are really using it. Now, there are companies, organizations around the globe that are using these approaches, but it's predominantly behind closed doors. And there's two very broad main reasons for that. The first is we're talking about safety, talking about matters of safety. And so if you use a new approach and you find problems, you're not necessarily going to want to shout from the rooftops and you know publish about it. The second aspect is because these new approaches are fundamentally broader than traditional approaches, you can apply them earlier in your project or life cycle and identify issues earlier. So it provides a competitive advantage. So there are certain automotive manufacturers that are really running away with this and getting some great results over and above their traditional approaches. So my sort of personal mission really, and one of the main purpose of my talk today really, is to be a super spreader and sort of spread those ideas as broadly as I can, help people understand what it is and how it might benefit them and ultimately help them get results so that they can reduce risks, save lives and ultimately reduce costs. It's better for everybody. Over the last few years, as I mentioned, YouTube, I've done quite a few webinars and uh, posted a few YouTube videos and I've had interest from over 22 different countries, over 20 different industries, those that are highlighted in green, they're the industries that are really sort of embracing this and trying it out themselves. The red ones are starting to gain momentum, um, and then the black ones, they're just sort of playing around the edges. Now, <clears throat> you might be wondering, well, what is STAMP? You've still not actually told us what it is, Simon. You know, why do we need it? What, what are the challenges we've got to face? So, hands up, who's familiar with this particular accident? And I know it's not radio perfect. Just one person, two people. OK, well, this is uh, you know, quite popular in the technology newspapers. This is widely reported as the first fatal collision involving an autonomous vehicle. And this was the Uber self-driving car accident from March 2018. And essentially, just to sort of cut the story short, essentially there were no technical failures with this vehicle. It behaved exactly as it was designed, exactly as it was intended by the management of uh, Uber Technologies. Then there was this one. Hands up who's familiar with this one. Yeah, so this is the Boeing 737 MAX uh, series of two accidents. Now, my, I'm not going to go into too much detail technically about that, but I believe this will have a significant impact on the way that we design, certify, and sign aircraft off as safe in the future. This is a, you know, a, a watershed moment, I, I think. Now, in terms of challenges, clearly the challenges are, are common across all industries. So we've got change or constant change, the need to change, speed of technical innovation and the need to be first, complexity, especially software, um, and then the future with artificial intelligence. That's an interesting challenge from a system safety perspective. Human role changes. So the humans in the system moving from being a doer to a supervisor. Now that's a fundamental change to the architecture of the system. And then also in the context of human errors. So thinking about human errors more in the context of symptoms as opposed to causes. And then also fundamentally the change in the nature of accidents. So from accidents due to failures to accidents due to unsafe interactions where there have been no failures. So one of the major ways of dealing with complexity, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, 
is essentially the divide and conquer approach, or more formally the analytic reduction approach, which I think uh, Simon mentioned earlier on. So generally we take the physical and functional aspects of our systems and we break them down into distinct parts or components, we divide them up. And then in terms of behaviour, we split those up into distinct events over time. So you saw the time information just before lunch, so chains of events. And essentially we analyse the parts separately and then combine the results, but by doing that we make some really significant implicit assumptions. And they are that the components and their interactions, they behave independently, either as uh, an individual or as a whole, and that there are no feedback loops or nonlinear interactions between those components. So what we need is a new approach based on what's called systems theory, and I'm not going to go into the detail of that today, but just suffice to say that this is about a holistic perspective, big picture thinking, you know, and more formally you might refer to it as synthesis. So the concept is that uh, everything is part of a system. You've got components, interactions, hierarchical structures, and then boundaries. You've got a series of control or feedback loops and control structures. And then you have some emergent properties. And just to put a fine point on that, a lot of the stuff that was discussed this morning is very much in this context, thinking about things as a system with feedback loops. So STAMP then. So STAMP is an acronym, first and foremost. And it stands for Systems Theoretic Accident Model and Processes. And essentially that's two things. It's a foundation, a, an accident cause I can't speak, an accident causality model foundation with a series of analysis and design processes based upon it. And we'll be speaking about one of those processes cast today. Now you might be asked I've changed the order of the slide, sorry. <laughs> So where does STAMP originate? I think I already touched on that earlier on. So it originates from uh, Professor Nancy Leveson and her team at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, she's actually kindly made available this book as a free PDF download. So if you want to download a copy of that book, you're quite welcome. If you search for MIT Press, Engineering and Safer World PDF, it'll send you to that Dropbox link, you can download it. Uh, we also did a webinar together a couple of years ago now uh, where you can watch that uh, YouTube introduction at that address there. So let's talk about the theory. Accident causality. So what is an accident causality model? So essentially, very basically, it's a model or paradigm of how things happen, causality. And it influences how we think, talk, engineer and manage for safety, but also how we investigate. Everyone has one, at least one, um, and I'm going to talk about some, well, I'm going to talk about them now. So hands up who's familiar with Herbert Heinrich's famous domino model, accident causality model. Got a few quizzical looks, we've got some hands, great, excellent. So essentially this is predicated on a sequence of events, uh, progressing from, in this case, left to right. And if you remove one of those sequences or one of those dominoes, you essentially prevent that sequence of events from progressing into an accident. And this is, you know, this model is very sort of basic to everyone's understanding about of how accidents occur. Then we've got this one. Hands up who's familiar with this one. She'll get a full house with this one. Excellent. Look at that. Brilliant. Well done, James Reason. So this is James Reason's Swiss cheese model. And this essentially introduces the concepts of barriers or layers of protection, defense, defenses in depth. Essentially, you want to prevent accidents by having as, much, as many barriers as you possibly can and then hope the holes don't line up. And this, again, this is very core to everybody's understanding. This is taught and trained all over the place. It is literally the number one. Then we have the concept of a bow tie. Hands up who's familiar with bow ties. Not so many, okay. So again, this is the same underlying causality model. You've got some events that lead to other events that eventually result in some harm. Now this particular one is sort of a development of the first two, and it's very popular, particularly in aerospace and also in oil and gas. Is this familiar in terms of the work that you do, or is this not, not ingrained yet? Excellent, great, keep it that way. Okay. <laughs> so in terms of accident causality models, I've referred to the traditional view of uh, Swiss cheese, dominoes and bow ties, 
Um, I've not referred to them as the old view because I think they do have their places for certain applications, but for complex systems, they just don't go far enough. So the traditional view treats accidents as chains of directly related events or due to breached barriers. And it defines safety as a management of failures problem. So if we prevent failures, then we should be safe. We shouldn't have any accidents. Does that sound familiar? Excellent, great. So the stamp view, or the safety three view, no, I'm not gonna say that. Um, <clears throat> the stamp view, the realm of control loops and structures is that accidents are actually a bit more complicated than that and they involve complex dynamic processes. So fundamentally, we define safety as a dynamic control problem. So we want to control something as best that we can. And so to prevent accidents, we enforce constraints using what's called a control structure. So it is essentially lots of these working together to enforce constraints. And I keep turning my clicker off. There we go. So we're back to the basic control loop again. This is a more advanced, sort of detailed version of the same control loop. All I've done is add some detail about actuators and sensors. Are they familiar terms to people? It's a few nods, a few shakes. Okay, so if you imagine that this was you, the controller, and the control process was you driving your car, safe separation from other people, then your actuators would be your hands and feet, maybe your voice, you want to shout out the window for people. <coughs> and then sensors would be your eyes, ears, body, the accelerations on your body. And your process model would be your view of the environment around you, how close you are to other traffic, whether there's any speed cameras. Um, you might also have a speedometer on the dashboard, maybe a temperature or pressure sensor for the tires. And all that information is fed into your brain. Your brain processes it. Uh, has a mental model of what you need to do that's safe, such as if it's 50 miles an hour, you need to drive at 50 miles an hour, and your control algorithm is how you operate your vehicle safely. Everyone comfortable with that? Awesome. So if you want to have a control structure, essentially this is just a number of these loops arranged in a hierarchy interacting with each other. So in this case, if you imagine that you were a you were your driving instructor trying to teach somebody else how to drive, then you would be the green controller and the other driver would be the, the, the new driver, the learner driver would be the red one. So can you imagine what type of control algorithm and process model you must have when you're trying to facilitate somebody else learning how to drive? You know, you'll, you'll probably want to look further up the road than you do normally. You'll probably want to keep an eye on who's behind you and how close they are in case the new driver stalls, for example. So what I'm really highlighting here is that this control loop, this control structure, helps you to model pretty much any system you want to think about, and it helps you to look at things in specific detail. Great, so what is a control structure? I've sort of already said that. So I sort of view a control structure as essentially being like making a jigsaw puzzle. So you've got these control loops, these jigsaw pieces, and you want to arrange them into a control structure. And all together, excuse me, all together that control structure enforces constraints on the control process to ensure that it is safe. Thanks. So this is just an example. I do apologize, it's an aerospace example. Please don't throw anything. So if you can imagine two aircraft flying in airspace, they both have a trajectory. So the physical process is the trajectory. And ultimately, we don't want aeroplanes to crash into each other. So we want to keep those trajectories under control and make sure they don't conflict or collide. So conceptually, we've got some aircraft. They control their trajectory. They're under the control, conceptually, of some aircrew of some description. And they have some flight crew training manuals. They also have some technical equipment that helps them with maintaining safe separation. And this is called TCAS, or more precisely, Traffic Collision Avoidance System. And all together, they should work together to stop the aircraft crashing into each other. Well, they don't just work in isolation. There are other aspects in the control structure that are important for safe separation. So we've got some radio communications. 
so these crew can talk to each other. If you imagine flying at night, you know, 600 miles an hour directly towards each other, it's very difficult to see each other out the windscreen. So it's good if you can talk to each other on the radio. But that's not enough. We've got an air traffic controller, or air traffic control officer, should I say. So the air traffic control officer controls a piece of airspace with airplanes within it through the uh, means of radio communication. And then the air traffic control officer has an updated mental model about the state of the airspace using some radar equipment that essentially picks out where the aircraft are in the sky. So this is just a very high level example of a control structure. You can get really detailed if you want to, but I don't want to, uh, you know, you know, it is after lunch and all. So then we ask, well, how do we analyze a control structure like that? Well, we talked a few moments ago about enforcing safety constraints through some form of control action. So if you're uh, an aircraft and you're told by an air traffic controller you need to descend, then your control actions are to descend and the control process is your aircraft. Now in the context of doing a hazard analysis versus an accident investigation, is everybody comfortable with the differentiation between those two? So one is analysing the system before an accident occurs to understand what we need to do to make it safer and an accident analysis is after an event has occurred and we're looking for something specific. So when you're doing a hazard analysis, you're looking for what are called unsafe control actions. So these are the control actions that will lead to an accident. But of course, when you're doing an accident investigation, you can't say whether somebody's action was unsafe or not because you weren't there. So um, we refer to them as contributory control actions when we're doing an accident analysis. Now there are four general types of unsafe or contributory control actions and those of you that are familiar with failure mode and effects analysis or functional hazard analysis will see some similarities here in the mechanics of these definitions um, and also if you do human factors HVACs classification if that means anything to anybody no okay um, so a general action required for safety is not provided so a control action is not provided and that results in an accident an unsafe control action is provided. Uh, a potentially safe control action is provided too early or too late or at the wrong time or in the wrong sequence. And then finally, a control action required for safety is stopped too soon or applied too long. So I'm just going to pick on the timing and sequencing one there for a second. So if you recall before lunch, we were talking about reporting information up to senior leadership in a form that they could understand so that they could make safety related decisions. Now the first thing to observe about that is, yeah it doesn't work on this screen does it? <laughs> Let me use my mouse, there we go. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, excellent. So if you imagine that this is the senior leadership team and this is the rest of the hospital organisation or the medical healthcare organisation, the people down the, at these levels will be providing information and statistics up to the senior leaders so that they can make safety related decisions. But if that information is in a form that is not clear or difficult for the managers to interpret, it won't update their process model appropriately, so they won't take potentially appropriate action when necessary, or in the case of timing or sequencing, they might, might actually delay management actions which has a positive impact on safety. So when you're looking at uh, information and statistics, always be mindful that it is a reactive feedback loop as opposed to a proactive action loop. Is everybody sort of comfortable with that? A few quizzical looks, excellent. There we go. So once you've identified the contributory control actions, you then want to understand and discover, well, why? Why did this particular controller, this person, this machine, why did it behave the way that it did? And this is where you start looking at issues with control algorithms. You know, was the learner driver, no, I won't use driving one, I'll use a the radiotherapy one. So talking about the Lisa Norris case, the planner B, I think they're called, that uh, created the treatment plan, why did they issue a treatment plan without the appropriate uh, calculation performed for the dose amount? Was it because they had an issue with the control algorithm? Well, yes, arguably it was, 
because they were not trained or they were not very experienced in doing a very detailed um, central nervous system profile. In terms of their process model, uh, sorry, in terms of their control algorithm, they did not know to apply that correction factor and the reason they didn't know to do that was because it wasn't updated in their process model. And the reason that was is because conceptually the process and training above them did not provide that information. So the fact that they issued an unsafe control action that contributed to harm was more complex than them just being a stupid human having human error, if that makes sense. So control structures then. So as I say, it's just a hierarchy of control loops, how they interact. This approach allows you to model any kind of system, whether it is just humans interacting with each other, whether it's a human and a computer, or whether it's organizational, or even artificial intelligence if you want to get that far. <clears throat> so thinking in terms of control structures and control loops, it helps to organize your thinking and understanding about the system that you're analyzing. And it provides a natural path to follow, a structure to work to, which is obviously really powerful when you're trying to do an investigation and do some systematic analysis. And I believe this is what really makes the stamp-based processes so powerful. And especially if you're working as part of a multidisciplinary team, because ultimately when you create this control structure model and put it on a piece of paper or on the wall, instead of you as a group of SMEs talking about what's in your mental model, you're talking about something that's on a piece of paper and everyone has a common mental model, a common understanding of what the system is and what the issues are. Now conceptually, and it's, yeah, I'll just use my arrow. So conceptually we have a patient who is uh, interacting with a nurse clinician or clinician and that is under conceptually the control of some equipment that delivers ionizing radiation, which is conceptually under the control of some other equipment, excuse me, that directly influences or controls that delivery, which is under the control of a therapeutic radiographer. And there are some employers and medical physicists in there and probably other roles that I've not included in here. And I'd love your feedback on this. Well then conceptually you can think about the operations and maintenance aspects. So in, in this environment it's a bit more complex than aircraft because you've got patients, you've got people interested in biological aspects, radiological aspects, and then the equipment and engineering aspects. <clears throat> you've also got to consider or think about the design aspects of the control structure. So who designs the equipment, who designs the facility and the procedures that have been used, maybe even the training. And then also, if necessary, whether emergency response is required. So what does the emergency response control structure look like? And then also conceptually, governmental control structure, legal control structure, and then regulatory control structure in the case of the uh, IRMA regulations. But of course, all models are wrong, but some are useful, said this world famous statistician George E.P. Box. I don't actually know what he was famous for, but I know he was famous for saying this. One of his other quotes was that we need to remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? So what I'm trying to say here, two things. The first is these approaches are model-based approaches. So you model the system that you're interested in, the situation that you're interested in, but be mindful that the analysis is based on the model. You're not analyzing the real world. And of course, you don't want to make your model so complex that you lose the plot. You want to make it as detailed as it needs to be to be useful for your purposes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about roles. So when you're doing an accident analysis, there is generally, very generally, three broad roles. An investigator role, an analyst role, and a recommendation maker. So when I was talking earlier on about control algorithms, when you're doing an investigation, your brain will be working in one of these three. And the exercise we did with Simon before lunch was really helpful because it forced us to analyze the problem before we jump to solutions. And this is what I'm sort of emphasizing here. So thinking, when you're doing an accident analysis, think about what is the mental model and algorithm I'm using at that moment. Am I an investigator looking for information and facts, trying to make sense of things, 
Am I an analyst of that information or am I making recommendations for improvements and change? And it's really important to be clear about that because that perspective can change the way that you're thinking and that thinking can mislead you in some cases. So an example of this is in the context of a core principle of safety investigations. So typically, or in the past, maybe not so much now, the investigation was to seek to assign blame. So find somebody who made a mistake and then blame them. That's it. That's where the investigation stops. But that's, but this, that's quite a narrow view. And that type of investigation will not find uh, a detail about what's actually caused these people to behave the way that they did. And if you stop your investigation there, you will miss things and potentially have a repeat. So ultimately, the core principle I'm emphasizing here is that we're not seeking to assign blame. It's not the same as seeking to understand, and that's what we're trying to do as part of the investigation. Now, it's also important to think about the perspective, and I touched on this earlier on. So if you are an observer of the system or the investigation or the situation that you're looking at, you need to take a step outside and observe it from that perspective. But when you do the analysis, you need to step inside as though you are a participant with the people or processes that are involved. So you have to be, in the case of an air crash, you have to be on the flight deck with the pilots and understand the context of why it made sense to them to behave the way that they did at the time. Or in the case of Plan B in the, uh, <coughs> in the event we're going to talk about later on, why did it make sense to behave the way that they did? Well, they were under training. The procedures didn't tell them to do something. So how could they know to miss something, if that makes sense. But also think about the life cycle and possibilities of what it is you're looking at. So think about conceptually the physical process where harm has occurred. So I've highlighted the patient setup and treatment delivery because ultimately that's where the accident occurs, that's where people get harmed. But think broadly, think outside of that, think about the entire life cycle you know, from when the patient arrived, from when the planner arrived to do the work that they did, and think outwards. But it's Im also important to think conceptually from a, what I call a systems engineering perspective. So operations and uh, maintenance modification and events during operations, or accidents, incidents, and near misses, they're very much the time that the, har that the harm occurred. But when you're doing your analysis, doing your investigation, think outwards beyond that. What happened during installation and commissioning? What happened during manufacture and creation? What happened during design, you know, divergent and convergent thinking? So problem definition, solution definition, and iteration. But even right back to the concept, you know, identification of a need, because there may have been, may have been some flawed concepts at the beginning. So we mentioned autonomous vehicles earlier on. <coughs> okay. Also, be mindful of the circle of influence or sphere of influence. Hands up if this is familiar to you. There's a few of you. Okay. So essentially, this is uh, Stephen R. Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about a circle of concern. So in the center of the circle, you've got things that you can personally and directly control. They're directly under your control. You then also have things that are further away from you, but that you have influence over that's indirect. And then a broader sphere of influence or concern, uh, which is things that you're interested, a bit interested in or concerned about. Now you'll notice that, ah, didn't print it out. Anyway, so you remember the driving instructor example with the extra controller on top. If you imagine that you're the learner driver, you have direct control of the vehicle. Whereas from a driving instructor perspective, you only have influence over that vehicle. And so when you're looking at the control structure model, think about, you know, in terms of direct control, influence, and concern, where does that sort of fit? Now, going back to talking about recommendations and flipping between uh, problem analysis and solution definition and then recommendations, when your brain switches between those three, be mindful that when you're investigating, if you are only looking at things that are directly under your control or your influence, you might miss things as part of the investigation or not even document them. 
one of the discussions at lunchtime was about staffing levels. So if you're investigating a, an issue in the radiotherapy area, if there are issues with staffing, from an investigator perspective, you might not have any kind of control or direct influence over that. So you might not include that as part of the report, especially if it's an ongoing issue that's a feature in everything. You might just forget about it. So what I'm emphasizing here is when you're doing your analysis and your investigation and your recommendations, don't narrow your focus because of this circle of concern. As an investigator, you're outside the system looking at it, and so your circle of concern is very broad. Is everybody comfortable with that? Great. So let's give you a CAST accident analysis overview then. So CAST stands for causal analysis based on systems theory, or causal analysis based on stamp, depending which book you read. Um, <clears throat> as part of a basic investigation process, so a very, very high level investigation process is you observe what's happened, what's going on, you document the information, the details, and then you set a plan. How are we going to investigate this? What resources do we need? What subject matter experts do we need? Then you'll establish some facts, you'll do some analysis, you'll form some findings, some conclusions, you'll make some recommendations. And this is where cast accident analysis fits. So it's part of the analysis phase. It's not an investigation method, it is an analysis method. Now as you get more experience with CAST, you can actually use it to steer the plan for the investigation. Because the control structure model for your particular scenario won't really be that different between each different accident. And so once you've created a control structure for one accident, you may be able to renew it for, uh, reuse it for another investigation analysis. And then when you're making recommendations, you could use the STPA hazard analysis. Now I'm not going to talk about that at all today because we haven't got enough time, but essentially this will help you to make more specific recommendations um, and also manage the potential risk of making a recommendation that undoes other good work that's been done. So let's talk about CAST. So the ultimate goal of CAST is to establish what was the control structure that existed at the time the accident occurred, understand how and why it allowed or contributed to inadequate control. And we're not just focusing on failures, as I mentioned earlier on, or what went wrong. We include that, but we're also looking at what went right and contributed to an accident. And this Lisa Neeson one is exactly, exactly one of those. And then we make recommendations. So what changes to the control structure do we need to make? What changes to the algorithms or mental models do we need to make? So on one page, this is a very high level overview of the process. So we've got what's called, I call the foundation phase. So we define the losses, the accident, what's actually happened, what harm has occurred. We, we identify the hazards related to those losses. And then we identify high level safety constraints. And all these are, are the high level constraints that we need to control those hazards and prevent those accidents. Then we do some modeling, the modeling phase. So we model the timeline, which is not strictly, past, strictly part of cast accident analysis. It's something you'll probably do as part of your investigation anyway, but I've included it here to make it explicit. We model the control structure, and then we perform some analysis, the analysis phase. And this is three parts, and it's not sequential, it is iterative, because obviously as you identify more information and do more analysis, you'll identify different questions that you need to go and ask. So you analyze the physical process, then you analyze the control structure, so you look at the components in that structure, and then the actual structure itself, and then you make recommendations for implementation and, and support implementation, if that's what uh, you're going to do. But we're only going to focus on control structure analysis today. So I've got a bit of a confession to make before I continue. So uh, I had a Windows automatic update the other day, and uh, it kind of caused me a few problems generating some nice control structure pictures. So the ones that are in here are a bit of a scribble, so I do apologize. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so in terms of the accident itself, it occurred at Beetson Oncology Center in Glasgow in 2006. And it was an overexposure of a patient uh, with 50%, 58% higher than prescribed dose. 
Now, the information I used for this report, uh, for this uh, very brief case study, was literally just the 100-page official report. So I've not done any research or looked at any other papers or any other work that people have done because I didn't want to corrupt the analysis that I've uh, attempted here. <clears throat> but the first thing to sort of observe, you me I mentioned earlier on about one of the key safety investigation principles about seeking to find blame. And this is some expert of text from the report. So the report concludes that most of the responsibility and hence any blame that can be attributed to treatment planning staff at the BOC falls to the staff member referred to in the report as Principal Planner A. And I'm hoping that it's clear that that's not really appropriate if we're trying to do an investigation. Um, so yes. Next one, so timeline. So some of you said you were really familiar with this. So I'm just going to focus on the key parts. Um, so. There we go. So prior to the intro, can you see that? All right, is it a bit small? A bit small. I'm really sorry about. It. I'll read. I'll read it out. So prior to the introduction of the Varis Seven, which is a a computer software system, in May two thousand and five, the actual prescribed treatment dose was not entered into it Eclipse. So Eclipse is a treatment planning tool as part of that system. Therefore, all treatment plans computed by Equip Eclipse were for a standardized dose of 100 centigrades per treatment fraction and the MU figure in the treatment plan report that was print printed by the system was always in the units of MU per 100 centigrade, centigrades. So all I've highlighted there is before the software change, all treatment plans were standardized and so the MU was always in the units of 100 centigrades. So at that point in time, prior to May 2005, there was no need to normalize any of those values in the plan and there was no need to include a change in the procedure. <clears throat> so prior to the introduction of the system there was a decision by the BOC management. The investigation report doesn't elaborate who or where they are so in terms of the control structure model there isn't very much information there that I can use uh, but essentially they made a decision to use the Eclipse planning system as a standalone module within the overall architecture of the various system for a number of operational and technical reasons and that technical decision is quite key. So in May 2005 they upgraded to the new Varis 7 system and that allowed the treatment delivery parameters in the Eclipse treatment plan report to be transferred electronically to another software module um, and this was previously done by manual transcription of data to paper forms. However, for some of the most complex treatment plans, including the whole central nervous system plan, which is the subject of this particular analysis, uh, the use of paper forms was retained uh, at the BOC. <clears throat> so after the upgrade, there was a decision taken at the BOC to integrate the Eclipse module more fully with other ver various software modules. Uh, right, so that's a bit of context on the software. Um, so September the 13th, 2005, the patient was referred to the BOC by a consultant clinical oncologist with a course of radiation treatment for a relatively rare brain tumour. In October of 2004, or October, November 2005, so just a short while after, Principal Planner A, who was criticised and blamed quite considerably, their responsibilities for the quality safety management system were passed to another member of staff. So if you're thinking about the control structure, thinking about what the control loop looks like, you've got Principal Planner A in control of the quality management system, but at this point in time, that structure was changed. There we go. So in November 2005, Planner B, uh, a relatively new person, had prepared a similar plan to the CNS under supervision. Now the prescribed radio dose was input to the Eclipse module and normalization of the output was therefore applicable, and, but Planner B was unaware of the need for normalization and did not apply it. So this was technically their first near hit. But because the numbers worked out in such a way it didn't matter, no harm occurred. <clears throat> so in 
So December 2005, staffing of radiotherapy physics was almost full complement and some very experienced staff had been appointed. And then in the period, the 16th to the 19th of December, Planner B did the bulk of the treatment planning for Miss Norris using the Eclipse treatment plan report and then the medulla planning form. So this uh, blue area here, I just want to highlight here that there were three treatment plans created, one for the head, one for the upper spine, one for the lower spine. And Principal Planner A kicked off the first one on Thursday the 15th of December. Then Planner B took over and continued to complete the plan. In the upper spine, Planner B started uh, both the upper and lower spines uh, plans. And then something strange, I don't know whether it's uh, you know, a, an issue with the system or the way that they were doing this, working in parallel perhaps. But on Monday, December the 19th at 10.40 and 32 seconds, Planner B modified the head, prof uh, the, the head plan and then the lower spine plan exactly at the same time. Then less than one minute later, the uh, treatment plan for the head was printed. And then for the lower spine, it was done at quarter past three in the afternoon uh, on the same day. And then two days later, it was done quarter past three by principal planner A. Now, all I'm really highlighting there is just some information on a timeline, but just to give you an overview of how you could arrange information in a timeline and start thinking about the control structure, how information is passed around it, but also the way time sequences, time sequence aspects can be thought about. So for me, it seems a bit odd as an investigator that working on two really important complex treatment plans that one person can do it at the same time. So is there a question about perhaps Planner B has lent their login details to somebody else to do some work? Or is it a computer glitch issue that's updating two records at once? I don't know the details, I'm just postulating they're the kind of questions that I'd probably ask from this kind of information. So then, 31st of December 2005, the head of radio therapy physics left the organization and then between the 5th of January 2006 and the 31st of January this is when the harm occurred uh, the receipt of a dose of ionizing radiation much greater than intended and then the 12th of January um, it was identified that they'd received only five of the planned 20 fractions uh, but then they ceased treatment because it was not considered uh, appropriate then on the 1st of February so in terms of the organisation, thinking about the organisation controlling the treatment of somebody, the organisation mental model, they were not aware that this harm had actually occurred. So they could not take action because they didn't know about it. But something else happened, uh, Senior Planner D identified the error and then fed that back into the organisation so they could kick off the, uh, the investigation and also change the, the, the treatment. Okay, so I'm going to very briefly talk about losses and hazards. Um, I mentioned very earlier on at the beginning about concepts, so the English word accident will mean something to you. In this concept, uh, sorry, in this context, the, the, the concept is broader. So we're thinking about undesired or unplanned events that result in loss, including loss of human life or human injury, property damage, environmental pollution or mission loss. And we're also thinking broadly about types of losses that are unacceptable to our stakeholders, such as brand damage or loss of service. So what I'm really highlighting here is you can use this approach not just for the benefit of safety investigations, but also for improving other aspects that you might be concerned about or your stakeholders are concerned about. So what is a hazard? Again, this is another word that's used very broadly, but in this context, it's very specific. So we're talking about a system state or set of conditions that together with specific environmental conditions can lead to an accident or loss. So it can be a condition or a state or it could be a, an event in time. And this diagram I've highlighted here is just to sort of give you an idea that the definition of a hazard is within the bounds of what the designer can control. So one example I always give, and it upsets all the air transport people, 
is the concept of a mountain range in the context of flying an aeroplane. So the definition of hazard that they use, that's mandated by the International Civil Aviation Organization, basically says that a hazard is anything that has the potential to cause harm. And I'm sure you can see that that's a very big bucket of things. So how does anybody manage, you know, understand what's important and then manage it? Whereas that's overcome with this definition because it narrows it to what you can actually control. So if you're an airline operator, you can't control the existence of a mountain range, you know, even with nuclear weapons. So what can you do? Well, the only thing you can do is control the trajectory of your aircraft and its proximity to mountain ranges. So clearly, they have the control of the aircraft, but they have to control the interaction with that environmental state or event. So going back to control structures and modeling, so thinking about jigsaws with uh, these jigsaw pieces. So start with the physical process, think about where the harm has occurred, uh, where the energy has been transferred, think about the hazards and the high level safety constraints, what are the constraints, constraints, controls that need to be true to control that hazard? And then think about a high level of abstraction. So identify the controllers, their controls that exist or are supposed to exist. You know, in the case of this uh, case that we're talking about, there's supposed to be an independent check that takes place. So in terms of your control structure model, not only have you got treatment plan of B, and senior planner A, you've also got planner C and planner D. So how do they interact with each other? What is the purpose? What, what is their algorithm? And think holistically, big picture. Everything is a system. You're looking for these jigsaw pieces when you're doing your analysis. But also be mindful that you're going to be doing quite a lot of mental gymnastics. And what I mean by that is when you're thinking about the control structure and the detail, you're going to be iterating that model until you get a clear picture of the issues that you're investigating and you'll have to evolve it and abstract it, zoom in and out as necessary. And that is quite a challenging skill to acquire and develop, but it is something you can do with practice. Now talking about the patient pathway, is this the right term? Yes, okay, excellent. So thinking about the patient setup and treatment delivery, think about the control loops, the controllers, the people, the processes, the organizations, the technology that are involved in each of those phases and how they interact with each other, how they exchange information and control actions. So this is a very, as I mentioned, it is a bit of a Mickey Mouse picture, I apologize. Um, so you've got your Lisa Norris, the patient at the bottom, they are conceptually under the control of the consultant clinical oncologist. They did an assessment that required a treatment booking form to be filled in, which was communicated to Beetson Oncology Centre. So this is a very high level example. Um, if you were examining an incident where a patient received late treatment, for example, because the referral was late, you could start your investigation with this very high level control structure. Then we've got a bit of a more detailed one. I don't know if you can see that very well. Essentially what we've got at the bottom, the physical process, is the person, the patient themselves. They are under the control and influence of the equipment which delivers the ionizing radiation. That is under the control of equipment that controls or influences that but there are also other controls. So, for example, the treatment bed. That interacts with the patient and can move them around, potentially cause problems. That equipment is under the control of an operator, conceptually, a medical physics expert is involved in that, and then there is some form of practitioner. And the practitioner and the operator has some form of interaction with the person, either directly or through some kind of uh, vi video or radio link. The right, okay. So I need to change this then. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then the referrer at the very top, they receive sufficient medical data about the person so that they can provide that information to the practitioner so that they can conduct their treatments. So very high level then, thinking very high level about this control loop, very abstract. We've got the patient at the bottom, we've got the radiographer, and we've got the treatment planner. So let's have a, uh, where is it? Which one is it? This one. So if I can get this one out in front of you then. 
So the analysis of the control structure is performed in two parts. The first is the structure analysis, this red one. Uh, sorry, the component analysis is this red one. So if we take the radiographer and we say, well, what are the safety-related roles and responsibilities and safety requirements, constraints associated with the radiographer? What are their safety-related responsibilities? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. Any more? And make sure it's to the right patient. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good one. I missed that one, that's great. Any more? Um, I think check the, the dose is reasonable for the conditions, so aligned with the clinical protocol or things locally. Okay, so just talk about that one a little bit more then, in the context of a what must the control algorithm be of that uh, radiographer then? So they need to know what the dose is, so that's part of their mental model. They need to have an algorithm that knows to check, you know, is it a reasonable treatment amount for that type of operation? Yeah, yeah? okay, that's a good one. Their own limitations. Yep. That's a good one. That's interesting. So I think we mentioned the other day that um, I think this one, when they did the numbers, it was something like 58 or something. I can't remember exactly. But the number that was on the sheet was a reasonable number for the treatment received. So the control algorithm of this uh, radiographer, being a good radiographer and checking all the numbers, Doing a you know rule of thumb, does that look like a reasonable treatment? I think, uh, I think the, the monitor units should be fifty something. Yeah. But on that field or one of the fields, it came out about ninety something monitor unit. But for the course of treatment or for the prescription of like one point less than two gray perfections, yeah. as a so as a planner myself, I would think wow. Well, the number it looks that right, doesn't look too wrong. So your mental model says, well, I wouldn't think like, oh, you know, 50 and 90, because 90 is still within my mental model, is the safety range. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> if the radiographer control action is to provide the treatment to Lisa Norris, and their algorithm is as you've described, because that's what a good radiographer would do, their mental model was updated with the actual proper number that was wrong, but they didn't notice or realise that. Now, they, there would be an expectation by the radio that that plan has been checked by two months. Absolutely, yeah. So their mental model is this treatment plan I've received from the treatment planner is good to go. So they've all got green ticks. Let's go and give the uh, dose. Everything's fine. So in terms of the unsafe control action, or sorry, contributory control action, providing treatment, unsafe treatment to Lisa Norris, in this case the radiographer, you know, they behaved appropriately. That's really interesting. So let's just step out of the accident analysis for a minute and start thinking about making recommendations. So if we've identified that the control algorithm of this radiographer is something that's not going to get updated very often or practiced a lot because they only see a couple of these a year, think about the training control controller above this person. What training should be provided? to make sure that they are equipped to deal with this situation appropriately. What must that part of the control structure look like? What must the process model of the training team be? What must the algorithm be? You know, if, if this is something that doesn't happen very often, is there something else that can be done? Perhaps simulation training or something. So all, all I'm just sort of pointing out there is that this approach, when you start thinking in terms of control loops and structures, you start to spot opportunities for improvements, robust opportunities. 
and I was I chose training specifically because it's easier to show you know if you need this person to behave in a certain way you want to influence their control algorithm and mental model and training is one way to do it but there are other things that you can do in introduce other things so going back into the analysis then so the radiographer issued a contributory control action to this particular event we've identified the control algorithm and mental model was adequate in terms of safety related roles and responsibilities um, what other questions do you think should be asked of that treatment uh, of that radiographer Uh, the radiographer, the, this person here. What other questions do you think we can ask as part of the analysis? Thinking about the loop. What feedback did they have about the patient and the state of the patient? So did the patient say anything about how they were feeling about their treatments? That's so a good question, yeah. So just a yeah. It's not mentioned in the report that. Okay. So to ask a cheeky question then, so in the taxonomy that's used to classify these kind of incidents, is there a taxonomy associated with the barrier of feedback from the patient? So think for a minute about, before we go and apply some treatment to this patient, think about the mental model and algorithm of the patient, especially a young person. Do they know anything about the procedure they're going in, or the type of issues that they've got? Do they know to provide that feedback if they're feeling a bit odd? You know, we're talking, before the break we were talking about the action levels in data if you imagine that there's an action level beyond which they need to say something, are they told that before? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. But also, if it's a minor, the patient and Oh, so what does the control structure look like with a patient and a parent? What are the mental models and algorithms of those people? How do you help, you know, to get feedback from them that maintain safety? I'm sort of asking these sort of questions just to spark your thoughts about control loops and how they interact because it's those interactions that can give you safety benefit but likewise it can challenge your assumptions because if you assume you've got a barrier and start thinking about it like this you might find the barrier is not as robust 
as you think it is. Actually, a 15-year-old girl, the parents would not necessarily have any part. Oh, okay. And it, it, you know, she would be regarded, she would, unless there was some other reason, she would potentially be regarded as being competent. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so there's, okay, so let's just examine that. Yeah, that's right. Let's just examine that for a second, thinking about the holistic big picture at the very top of the control structure, we've got legal and regulatory aspects. And what we're saying is in Scotland, there is a different structure at that level than there is in, in the England, for example. What, what effect? Because, because she was 12 years old, I think she, she could be assessed by the, by, by the doctor to have sufficient understanding to make her own decision. That's, that opens up quite an interesting conversation about algorithms and mental models. Okay, so let's talk about the treatment plan now then. Yeah, go for it. There was, there's only one case I know of where there was immediate feedback from the patient going back to the radiographer. She goes to Therac 25. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, oh, am I spoiling something? No, 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 you carry on. Uh, it, it, it was all over the place. Basically, the, um, there was a machine basically typed in some stuff into the machine and then you very quickly changed your mind within about eight seconds. The, um, basically, if you selected um, electrons and then very quickly went, oh no, I meant photons, and typed that in, the machine didn't correct in time. So it would deliver um, photon levels of electrons down the waveguide um, with only the scattering four in place. So I think they got about 40 gray French. And patients immediately basically said it felt like they got an electric shock and like they were being burned while they were on there. And most shamefully, um, it was it was largely ignored. Um, <laughs> patients have received subsequent treatments, machines were tested, um, and it was only when talking about kind of stepping into the situation, it was only when a physicist sat down with the radiographer and said, "Show me exactly what you did." And at radiographer speed, she said, "Oh, I typed in electrons, then I changed it to photons." And it was only then that they reproduced the incident. Um, but it occurred um, at multiple centres, I want to say internationally. And the manufacturers couldn't understand it. The, um, the physicists could never replicate it until that situation. But it's, it's one of the few examples I know where at fraction one, you would meaningfully have that. Yeah. Okay. But then sometimes you've had, you've had like, uh, all the power <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because are, are we updating your algorithm now? No. no. Sure. All right. <laughs> I think that's one of the UK, uh, the two made one of the two major incidents in the UK. I think yeah. I can't remember if it's on the cobalt unit or the other one. Um, I think the nurse spot the side effect on the patients, but then and then they got the physicist to check, and then they went in to check the calculation. Everything looks fine. And didn't like take the opportunity. I mean, like, to spot that error mm -hmm. in the calculation. So they carry on, carry on for quite some time. So it did affect quite a lot of patients. I think that's so. Like, I think it's a similar kind of uh, theme that yeah. I think we can see. So you can argue like we, maybe we haven't actually learned. Oh, well, I'll I'll, 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 I'll come back to it because this this guy sort of nailed it. So the Therac twenty five examples are a case study that, so the originator of this, Nancy Leveson, she uh, wrote some papers on Therac 25 in the 80s, well 90s, early 90s, and that prompted her first book, Safeware, which you can also buy, I'm not telling you. Anyway, um, <coughs> so yeah, she, she talks about that, wrote a paper, and I can send you a link to it. But that particular accident was, um, from a technical perspective, quite interesting because they changed the design of the machine. It looked basically the same, but they'd removed mechanical interlocks and it was all under software control. And the behavior of the nurse, you know, not human error, it was the way her inputs entered the software that caused the software to behave the way it did. So it was going to do that. And I think it hurt and killed quite a few people. Um, so that, in terms of the story of Stamp, that's certainly, I think, one of the starting points of it. So, so yeah, anyway, very good. Ten, ten out of ten. <laughs> okay, so 
Talking about the treatment planner again. So the treatment planner's algorithm was, uh, I need to create a complex treatment plan. Um, they were not uh, trained formally for it. They were under training, under supervision. Um, and their mental model was not, we need to do this fraction calculation. Now if I go to a more detailed control stream. Oh, there we go, sorry. <laughs> yes, so <clears throat> if you imagine the treatment plan is the process under control, so I'm, I'm drawing a, a, a more abstract, different view of this accident, a different part of the control structure, and I'm looking at the interactions between the planner B, who was the person under training, under supervision of principal planner A, and then senior planner C, who essentially reviewed it and signed it off. So we talked about the treatment planner B, they created three treatment plans with uh, mistakes that were not mistakes because they wouldn't know any better. That treatment plan was interacted with by the principal planner, so they received information about the planner and they identified issues with that plan. They then made those appropriate changes. And then when senior planner C came to look at the treatment plan, this feedback loop here, they'd interacted with principal planner A and by influencing through conversation, senior planner C focused on the technical issues that principal planner A had already dealt with, as opposed to the actual details in the treatment plan. Now this is just a high level model, just for the purposes of getting the juices flowing in your mind. But if you think about principal planner A in the context of their control algorithm, they were a very ex experienced person. You know, the decisions that they made were based on, you know, experience across the entire organization. In terms of their mental model, um, they didn't have enough staff to do this complex planning. And even the procedures that they created that said only these staff can do this complex training, their algorithm was to make a decision to allow this non-trained person to do it because it's good for training and there's no one else that could do it. But that was in contravention to the procedures. Now I've just sort of talked a lot of different topics there and obviously when you're doing a proper analysis and investigation you'll be systematic and document these things. But I'm just trying to sort of get you to think about the control loop, what the actions are, what the feedback is, what the algorithm and mental models are. Are there any sort of questions on that before we move on? Everyone's like, wow, this is amazing. Great, okay. So let's talk about the structure. Which one is it? Where is it? There we go. Let's talk about the structure of this now. So it's exactly the same control structure model, but instead of looking at control at component analysis, we're going to look at structure analysis. So in terms of in terms of structure, architecture, and interactions, what can you observe about this control structure? What's the first thing that leaps out at you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What, what does that mean for coordination then? Communications and coordination. It's not very clear actually, from a very diagrammatic point of view, where a decision is made. Yeah. If there's nothing but it says, you know, this is where it comes in. Okay. So just to sort of take your view of this picture. So this picture is not a flow chart. This model is just representing structure and interactions between components in a hierarchy. And so uh, you've got the three people, three controllers, and the control process. That process is to create a treatment plan. So uh, essentially that is the product of what's going on. In terms of senior planner C and planner B, there's no loop between those. Is that right or is that wrong? Do you think it's a good idea to have a loop between those? Like you have, like, uh, well, just my personal So, like, if you have a planning team, it's usually you have, like, the planner, which is like the planner B, and then the checker. So, the checker can be plan A, can be planner C. So, that's the role you play in that environment. 
受語都。I guess depends on the complexity of the plan. Sometimes the planner B can go and talk to planner C and say, "I have this very complicated plan." Or like if you can't, if it's not like a straightforward uh, plan, then you might discuss other solutions. But if there is already like a procedure for you to follow, say if it's just purely calculation, you don't need a lot of optimization in that process. Yeah. Then the the fantasy might not even be needed. It's just whether did I follow the very complicated procedure mm -hmm. correctly. Okay. Right, yeah. So if we're talking about signing off a treatment plan as compliant and correct and safe, there is a requirement for independence between that check mm -hmm. and the creator of that treatment plan. Yeah. So the reason C senior planner C does not have interactions with planner B is for that reason. But you'll notice that there is an interaction between senior planner C and planner A, principal planner A. So in the investigation, we'd want to establish whether that violated independence or not. We know from this case that that was true, but if you were doing an investigation for another, you know, that's the kind of question you could draw from this. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, Uh, we can have the room, I think maybe you've got the room for us till 4.30. Okay, well, are you, shall I carry on till 4 or mm -hmm. is that okay? Do you want me to run for the train or like... I don't want to sort of yeah. overstay my welcome. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'm showing here is essentially once you've got your control structure model, you've got the structural analysis aspect and you've got six topics to look at to spawn ideas. So you've got structure, architecture and interactions to consider communication and coordination, so we've touched on that. Dynamics, changes and evolutions. So in this particular case, uh, the person who fulfills this role of creating the plan, that should not technically have been planner B, but planner, principal planner A, put planner B in that position for reasonably justifiable you know, reasons. <coughs> From a safety management system perspective, so SMS, I don't know if that is a concept that's, is that something that you recognise in radiotherapy, safety management systems? But not with the term, not okay. with the terminology. So it's very similar to a quality management system, but more specifically about safety. Uh, it's, a, it's an aerospace thing at the moment, but it is becoming more broad. Uh, safety information system. So this is a, a royal term that essentially means things like incident reports or the provision of safety related data or uh, there was talk about treatment um, put, uh, protocols earlier on and the information that's contained inside that document. So you might say that a treatment protocol is an interaction but the information contained in there is very much part of a safety information system. And then of course safety culture. Okay, so this one is a, a different view again, and this includes the chief executive at the very top. Now just to highlight, it's only by convention that the chief executive is at the top. You can choose to model this however you want to do it, it's, uh, it's diverse however you want it, um, but I've included it at the top. So those of you that are familiar with this case, you'll be aware that the mental model of the executive was that they didn't know there were issues with staffing levels. So if you think about the feedback loop to that person, what do you think that feedback would look like? Okay. So, so is, is that a critical control action from the layer below? And if that's missing, what must the algorithm be of the people not providing that information? Does that sort of make sense to you? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to highlight here is just down here. So the organization, if you're thinking about the structure analysis, dynamics, changes and evolution, there was some restructuring of this um, organization due to staffing issues in the previous 12 months, I think it was. 
um, and various people were moved around the organisations and restructured and that led to the physics staff having two, two line management responsibilities effectively. One from a radiotherapy physics perspective and then from a clinical physics perspective. Now if there are challenges with communication and coordination, you know, what, what could we find in there if we started to look at it? Okay, so I think I've uh, talked about that. So I'm going to quickly just talk about the primary cause. So the investigation talks about a primary cause, and this is a label or term that's something I'm not familiar with. It's quite potentially political, so I'm just going to put inverted commas around it. But essentially the, the incident occurred because of an omission of a required normalisation procedure by the treatment planner. There we go. So, so talking about the control actions, the action to do the normalisation procedure was not provided. So that's the unsafe contributory control action. But when you look at the control loop and the algorithm and mental model, this individual did not know to do the normalisation procedure. So that's why they didn't do it. It wasn't because they omitted it. They couldn't omit something they didn't know that needed doing. Uh, maybe I'm mincing words there. In terms of entry of an erroneous output figure on the medulla planning form, so this is a control action by the treatment planner. Erroneous output, uh, entry of an erroneous output figure. So it was, only at, it was only considered judged to be erroneous after the fact. That's an outcome bias. That person did what they thought was the right thing to do because they didn't turn up to work to hurt somebody or kill somebody. So just to be really sort of, you know, specific here, when you're looking at control loops and control actions, you remove the judgmental nature of the analysis. Now, of course, you've got to be mindful of your own natural judgmentality, but when you're doing this type of analysis, it makes it easier to do that type of analysis. Is everybody sort of comfortable with that? Excellent. Okay. Contributing circumstances, inadequate training and experience, inadequate supervision. So if you think about supervision, if this is the person being supervised and this is the supervisor, you know, what does that control loop look like? What's the algorithms and mental models? Failure to update working procedures since 1998 and post-introduction of the Varis 7 software. We talked about this topic earlier on. Um, Again, if these are the procedures and processes in the QMS, who or what is involved in that control loop, if they're not providing updates, why, what is their algorithm, what is their mental model, you know, if, if they don't know they need to do it, or if there's something else interacting with them that's conflicting and preventing it, thinking about it like this will help you identify those issues. A decision to change practice regarding the dose entered into the planning computer. It wasn't clear in the investigation report who made that decision or why they made it, so I wasn't able to examine that, but I'm sure if you could go back and ask the questions, you could find something interesting. Staffing pressures and workloads. So this affects all manner of different things. So the point, and I think the young lady over there with the turquoise towel on mentioned it earlier. Clearly when you look at the entirety of the control structure, most of it is made up of people and organisations interacting with each other. And of course, if you haven't got enough people, then by logical inference, the control structure is degraded in some way. And that can contribute to accidents. So there was issues with the treatment planning workload and specifically for the, this particular patient's experience and availability, senior staff availability for plan checking, unable to maintain the BOC quality management system. So again, if this is the management system and these are the people responsible for it, you know, is it because they don't want to update it or, you know, what's going on there? Inadequate staff experience for complex procedure treatment plans, controlled documents not being reviewed via management review or audit. So if this is your auditing function, why is your auditing function not performing? You know, think about it like this. Awesome. So I'm going to quickly go through those now. So installation and commissioning of a new radiotherapy facility at another location. That was some work they were doing. 
purchasing and commissioning new equipment, including the Varys 7 system, change management. Uh, the organisation was barely equipped for normal operations, let alone complex change projects. And there was no evidence of clinical safety evaluation for introduction of the Varys 7 system or operational changes, and also unclear software change control. So if you were to visualise the control structure for introducing new equipment or software, who or what organisations do you think would be involved in that activity? Try and visualise what that might look like and how they interact with each other. And the, the, the important point for me as a system safety engineer, this, no evidence of clinical safety evaluation for introduction of a new system. That's, you know, quite a serious finding. But yet this report just glosses over it and ignores it. Okay, uh, individual responsibilities, unclear who was responsible for what. There was no written allocation and common understanding of responsibilities. Um, so just to highlight those then. So when you're doing your component analysis, one of the first things it talks about is what are the safety related roles and responsibilities for this controller in the structure. And this highlights directly that those individuals didn't necessarily know who was responsible for what. So again, the question becomes from a recommendations perspective, if this is the people that need to know what responsibilities they have, who are allocated to them formally, who or what is in the control loop above them, and why did they not provide those allocations? What could you do from a recommendations perspective? I'll just leave you to think about that. Uh, inadequate management of medical physics and radiotherapy. So this was where the coordination between two different parts of the organisation was. And then, of course, the non-compliance with the uh, IRMA uh, regulations from the procedures and records perspective. Um, so contributory factors. We've got delays in achieving compliance with employers' responsibilities. Failure to ensure treatment planning carried out by a properly qualified operator. And from a looking outside the organisation perspective and other incidents, learning from others' experience, there were similarities with a previous accident at North Staffordshire Royal Infirmary, which also involved introduction of a change to a computer system without a formal and detailed change evaluation and control. So in summary then, the computer package was upgraded to Varys 7, Manual data transfer was retained for all elements of the whole central nervous system procedure um, and there was an unawareness of the need for the critical normalisation step and it was omitted. And I've done that in orange because we spoke about oranges at the beginning. So then, final thoughts. An accident incident or near miss reveals that the control structure is inadequate in some shape or form. And so when you see your logs that say we're having one incident this month and 10 incidents the next month and 25 the next month, if you have any, it's telling you that something's wrong with the control structure. Sorry, something is inadequate with the control structure. Something could be wrong with it, but something could be right, but it's res resulting in a negative situation. So it is basically telling you you've got an opportunity, a massive learning opportunity if you go and have a look. Um, so, of course, near misses and incidents are actually cheap learning opportunities because if you don't kill anybody, you don't have to pay, um, you don't upset a lot of people. But also, individuals involved will be more prone to talk to you as an investigator. But it's, of course, really important to feed back to them so that they can build confidence in the investigation loop, which is why I put this on the screen. So keep this in your mind, think about it. When you're thinking about your problems, think about what the physical process is. You know, where does harm occur? Where does the energy transfer? Think about the concept of an operations control structure. Who's involved in operating this system? Who's involved in maintenance? Who's involved in the design of it, either from a procedures perspective or a technical perspective? And think about response and recovery. And then, of course, from an organisation management perspective, they have two broad functions. One is operations, deliver you know, care to patients, but also they have a design responsibility. They might not call it design, but when somebody makes a decision to reorganise the structure of the, or the, the, you know, the organisation because there aren't enough staff, 
what they're doing is redesigning the system and fundamentally changing the control structure. And if they don't necessarily appreciate that's what they're doing, they could actually make things more dangerous. So from an investigator's perspective, I've included those on the outside as a feedback loop. So they do an investigation of all of this. It's fed into the lead investigator and the subject matter experts. And then they provide recommendations to the organization management at the top. But of course, if the organization doesn't implement those changes, they're just going to keep investigating the same kinds of outcomes. And so that's why I've included these two red feedback loops to the investigators so that they know whether management are actually doing what is needed to ensure the safety of the system. And that is everything. Now, I have got a strength, weakness, and opportunities and threats, but I'm looking at the time. I think it's probably time to end. So just quickly, if you want to learn more about it, as I've mentioned, you can download the book for free. Uh, there is a website hosted by MIT, which has uh, various presentations on it, looking at the similar sort of stuff I've talked about today. There are quite a few about radi radiation therapy, so I do recommend having a look at that. If you're interested in the Therac 25 paper, it is on Nancy's sunnyday.mit website, so you can download and have a look at that. If you want to look at the formalised CAST Accident Analysis Handbook and learn more, you can download it there. It's 130 pages of information. Um, in terms of upcoming events, there was an MIT stamp workshop at the end of this month, but that's now been cancelled due to coronavirus. So I've still got some flights to Boston if anybody wants them. Um, in terms of, there is a European stamp workshop which uh, I've worked hard to bring to the UK for the first time and it's going to be hosted by the University of Warwick Manufacturing Group in Coventry. So if you fancy going to a free event to learn more and talk about it, please register for that. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, if you want to see more information from me, there's my YouTube channel. So remember to like, share and subscribe. Um, and if you'd like some slide packs from my previous talks, you're welcome to go to my website, whiteleysafety.co.uk. And that's all from me. So if you've got reflections and questions, I'd love to hear them. How can you see this helping you in what you do? If at all. <laughs> what benefits can you see? What challenges can you see? The benefit about Blame, okay. Absolutely. And, and for me, that's one of the biggest advantages of this, is you are analysing the system with people in it. You know, they're, they're, it's a complex system with people, procedures, organisations and, and technology. It's not going to be one person. You know, people don't go to work to kill people, they go to work to do a good job. And if they're involved in an event like this, of course, they're going to feel really bad and upset about it. But if the system is stacked against them, pointing fingers, using this approach basically pulls back the curtains. And that's one of the challenges in the, in the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and strengths, weaknesses and opportunities and threats. I always point out one of the strengths is that it can find things and be clear about it, but one of the threats is it finds things that people might not want to make explicit. So if you can specifically point at uh, staffing levels and training aspects, contributing to accidents, this will help you to make that explicit. And it's a logical position, it's not necessarily opinion, if that makes sense. So yeah, absolutely, that's, that's awesome. Any more other benefits you can see, or challenges? I like the idea of the major
even reading some of the reports and even maybe writing them, like you pointed out the language used, like, um, you know, omitted or at that time it, it wasn't, it was just a, that's, that's why, just going back to the types of control action, there are four broad types, provided, not provided, uh, early, late, time in sequencing, and then duration. So when you're talking about it in terms of control actions, there is no judgment. It's not, you know, you didn't do it, it's your fault, it's a fact, this is the behaviour that occurred. There's no judgment associated with that, no blame attributed. And then you examine, you know, well, why why did that control action occur? Is it because the control algorithm was inadequate? Well, it's, it's not that person's fault if their algorithm is inadequate. You know, it's a system problem. That's all. Awesome. Okay. Any other benefits, challenges, comments, questions? Or should I just get off? New mental model, new algorithm. Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, remember to like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, I'll stand out the way. Talk to them. Oh, you talk to them. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I hope today, um, you know, three short sessions, and I hope, uh, you know, it will have opened up your mind, um, and I hope the information you get is useful. And if there are, like, you know, things that you want to explore a little bit more, uh, you know, please feel free to get in touch, and then hopefully we will be able to organize something, uh, you know, for the radiotherapy community. Um, Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much for making the effort to come all the way, you know, to here. Uh, despite you know all the coronavirus threat, you know, we have <laughs> around us. Um, yeah. So thanks again, and have a safe journey home, from Scotland, Cornwall, like where Lister, wherever you are coming from, um, from home. Yeah. Mm. From London. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah, you're yeah. very welcome. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, they are here. Thank you very much for joining us on uh, virtually, and I hope that's uh, useful. And uh, hopefully, Corona arrives from stay with us for very long, and we can uh, meet once again next year face to face. Okay. That'll be awesome. Thank you. Bye yeah, bye. So if you want to learn about cast, stick your stickers on there. Come on. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, don't forget to. Uh, if you have Thanks very much, everybody. See you around. Yeah, so You're most welcome. We'll See you soon.